Thank you and good morning. Um, I'll keep this brief so that we can have more time for the interaction and questions. First, let me thank the Almighty God for a successful completion of the Upper East campaign. Um, we have done it smoothly without any casual casualty, no incident, no accident, and uh, we thank God for our lives and thank God for protecting us. Let me thank the Upper East Region for the cooperation we've had re received, the um, encouragement, the support wherever we've gone. I also want to thank the media who came with us from Accra. You've left your families, you've been with us, you've seen the terrain, you've seen the issues and then the local media, you are here with the people and so you know um, what the issues are and you also followed us around and um, you took part in everything that we did. I want to thank the security forces, especially the Ghana Police Service for the protection they gave us wherever we went. I want to thank the military for the protection they gave us when we were in the Boko area. I also want to thank our regional executives for a good job done. The organization was perfect. Uh, we started almost always on time, but um, we uh, normally run be beyond our time. We intended that we should be able to close um, early in the evening, but sometimes we had to run uh, late. I want to thank all the chiefs and people who had patience to wait for us, even sometimes when we had run beyond the normal time. The issues are still the same. It's mainly a farming region and that is the main preoccupation of the people and um, issues of uh, farmer support, uh, access to modern mechanized farming, access to agricultural inputs, uh, fertilizers, seeds, uh, weedicides, pesticides are uh, the common complaints that we hear. And, um, we need to find a way where we can support the farmer in a seamless manner that is more sustainable than we've done in the past. Uh, planting for food and jobs and other programs that we've had in the past have been a shot in the dark and really not sustainable programs. And that's why we think that the farmer service center concept where we register the farmers, get to know who the farmer is, know the acreage he's growing, know um, the crop is growing, we know his family, we know what he's doing and all that would help us to be able to target that farmer for um, a specific support. And so if we set up the farmer service centers in the districts, all the farmers in the catchment area would have to register. And when they register, we'll go measure their farms, know what they are growing. We even know their host households. We'll take a census of their households, uh, how many dependents they have and all that. So it will be a kind of small microcredit scheme where they give them all the support at the beginning of the farming season, the fertilizers, the good seeds that we decide. If they need mechanization service, do offer it to them. If they need harvesting services, do offer it to them. Combine harvesters and all that. And then at the end of the farming season, when they have harvested, they can sell their crops to the farmer service center at a minimum guaranteed price so that middlemen don't take advantage uh, of them. And um, when they have sold, the cost of the inputs will be deducted and whatever profit they have will be paid on to them. There's a need for us to urgently introduce agro-processing because we're not adding any value to the crops that they are producing. And so creating agro-processing zones where we bring equipment, small equipment, uh, using the private sector to buy the maize of them, pro produce corn grits, produce maize flour, and so on and so forth, produce cassava flour, you know, process granites, you know, process all the other crops that they produce, um, process their rice and package it nicely for the market. These are all things that would help to change um, the lives of our people uh, here. Of course, the road network is a major issue. 
and everywhere we went, people are complaining about roads. Our president says they built 12,000 kilometers of roads. Now, 12,000 kilometers of roads is like flying from Accra to Japan, non-stop. That's 12,000 kilometers. And if they had built 12,000 kilometers of roads, it should be obvious to everybody. <laughs> Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case. The roads are in a bad state. And the worst thing is that the roads that were formerly in a fair condition, they have refused to maintain them for the last eight years. And the roads that I knew were good uh, just four years ago have deteriorated so badly because there's no routine maintenance schedule for patching the potholes and all that. While you build new roads, you must be maintaining the existing road network so that um, it can serve for longer. If you take the Tamale to Bolga road, it's virtually falling to pieces. This road was built in President Rawlings' time, you know, and it's like 16 to 20 years old, and there's no uh, proper maintenance. It needs an asphalt overlay because of the heavy-duty trucks that use that road to connect to Burkina Faso. So these are the issues. Roads are a major uh, issue. The next is education and health care. Um, there, there's a need for more schools, more access to secondary education, more access to tertiary education. There are big gaps in terms of tertiary. For instance, if you start from Daboya all through the overseas area to uh, Kobori, to Yagaba, to Yizesi, to Fumbisi, to Sandima, all the way to Navrongo. There is no tertiary institution in that whole area. If they want to, uh, to access tertiary education, they either have to go to Wa or go to Tamale or come to Navrongo or to Borga. So there's a big gap there. And so we need a tertiary educational institution there. Considering that the activity there is mostly agriculture, whatever tertiary institution we put there should focus on agriculture as an issue. The next most important thing is unemployment. Indeed, it's number one. There are teeming young people who have nothing to do. And it's a ticking time bomb for us. If we don't do something about youth unemployment, uh, then I'm afraid uh, we'll have uh, some of what is happening in Kenya and Nigeria on our hands. And so that should be, youth unemployment should be declared a national emergency. And everything we, we, we must do to find something for these young people to do, we need to do. And so that's uh, the next major uh, issue. Other issues include women empowerment, uh, building modern markets so that we can promote economic activity, so that um, trading of goods and services you know, can take place uh, properly. So now that we've finished the país, um, our next region is Volta. And so uh, Apais has set a standard. Volta must start getting ready to be able to match up to what Upper East has done. Um, I also have coming up as part of the Mahama uh, Conversations uh, a youth program uh, in Bukum and um, that is going to be a first of its kind, a youth town hall where I will interact with young people and discuss their issues so that we can put their issues front and center before the nation. And so these are some of the things that are coming up. But all in all, it's been a successful four days. I want to thank Upper East again and thank everybody who has uh, helped to make this um, um, campaign a success. Thank you very much. I thought this was a presidential podium. <laughs> okay, so we'll take the questions in batches. We'll take the first three. We'll ask. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We'll ask Mr. Mahama to answer, and then we can take it from there. So, Beatrice, can you take and pass out? I think there's a microphone here, so if you can please, yeah. Yes, please. So, yes, for those who have questions to ask, yes. Yes, so just. Uh, in any order, please, yeah. Can you please 
state your name, your <coughs> media house, and then let's go. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Albert Sorry. I work for Joy News. I'm the regional correspondent. I'm also the regional secretary for the GJA. Thank you for this opportunity. I wanted to find out. Thank you. I wanted to ask about the uh, Pualugu multipurpose dam. Uh, it's one of the biggest promises that the current government made to the people of this region. Um, they haven't yet been able to execute the project. I want to find out um, what you think, first of all, of how the current government has handled this project, if it is part of your plans, and how differently you intend to handle it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I have a second one, please? Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Anaya Joseph Napoleon. I represent Group Indum. That's uh, Indum's media. My question to uh, you this morning is, uh, I want to know uh, what steps will you take to reset the, the economy? You know, uh, the economy is, is in shambles. Uh, so we are looking at the, the steps you want to use to reset the economy. The second question is that, uh, uh, we are looking. How feasible is the free scenario, uh, the, the 24-hour economy? Is this something that is doable? And the last one is a suggestion. Uh, you said you want to create for the people of Boku a new region. Uh, I want to suggest maybe why don't you create more districts? Since when you create new regions, you are going to spend more much money on it. Uh, since development is for the people, uh, we are looking for more districts that will help instead of uh, the regions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I said one question there, but of course we are out. Right. Thank you very much. My name is Anthony Adongo Apubeo. I work with the Ghana News Agency. Mr. President, um, my first question has to do with the roads. And um, I was very grateful when you talked about the roads uh, throughout your tour. Um, the Boku, Boga Boku Road was one of the major roads that you, I mean, you cut short for, uh, for work to begin in Upper East region. But unfortunately, you couldn't finish it before you left office. The present government has done something on it, but he hasn't finished. The first of all, are you prioritizing it when you come back? Secondly, if you look at the quality of work that has been done, I was in Kasua during the time you did the Kasua interchange. And then within the four years, we were able to finish with the work, except some few things. And the quality of work that was done there, if you compare that to the route that, I mean, the, the work that has been done on the Boga Boku route, you see the difference. And I think we also deserve the same first class route that was constructed there. I don't know when you come to power, would you improve upon it and then continue? Thank you. Yes. Thank you very, very much. So may I now ask Mr. Mahama to please give you the responses. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, Pualugu has been on the drawing board for quite a while. Um, when I was president, I was very familiar with the project. Um, it, uh, it's to serve three main purposes. The first purpose for which it was conceptualized is flood control. And so it was supposed to have a weir and um, the water will be restricted. And during the season when it is raining and it is expected that the Bagri Dam will be opened, a lot of the water would be let go so that it lowers the water level so that when the water from Bagri comes, it will not flood as extensively as it used to do. The second objective of Pualugu was to irrigate a huge expanse of land, I think about 10,000 uh, hectares of land for agricultural purposes. And then the third, which is a byproduct of the dam, was to produce about 30 to 50 megawatts of power. And so it's a very important project, and I think that 
we didn't start it because we were not able to yet procure dedicated funding for it. Because for a project like that, when you start funding it, it must continue to its, its completion. And so when this new government came, they took it up. And in 2019, they cut short for it. But I noticed something. They said it was going to be funded from Government of Ghana budget. And I knew that that was going to be a problem. Because to have an almost $1 billion project funded from Government of Ghana budget, then you can be sure that it will face the hazards that every other project that depends on the consolidated fund faces. And that is exactly what happened. Of course, it made a lot of political capital for uh, the president's party in cutting project, uh, cutting sort for that project. But I mean, one knew that uh, it was going to face very difficult challenges. Unfortunately, we have rather lost money because almost 12 million dollars was paid for no work done. You go to the site, there's absolutely nothing there, and so somebody has caused financial loss to the state and uh, must be held to account to come and answer uh, what happened. But it's a project that is desirable. We intend to uh, continue. We're not going to abandon it, but we're going to look for a source of dedicated funding for it so that we can push it from start to finish without the kind of hazards that projects like this face when they depend on the contingency, uh, on the consolidated fund. Um, talking about resetting the economy, everybody knows what the issues of our economy are. It is the structure of our economy. We borrow and we spend. We live above our means. We run a budget deficit that we carry on every year continuously. But recently, a new phenomenon was added under this government, and that was overborrowing. The reason for the crisis in which we are is that this government overborrowed, spent more than it was earning, and in addition, our traditional sources of income, they mismanaged. And so you have the situation where you are spending more, you are borrowing more, and yet the hen that lays the golden eggs, you're killing it, and so the golden eggs are not coming. And so what happens is the cocoa sector has collapsed completely. Cocoa sector in syndication used to bring 2, 000, uh, 2 billion fresh CDs into the economy every year. This year we hardly were able to uh, borrow even 800 million. And so that is a traditional source that has held this economy since God in Gagisbeck time. They have come and mismanaged it. Produce buying company has collapsed. They are selling their assets. Produce buying company bought 30% of the cocoa that we exported in 2016 when I was president. Today they have bought zero and uh, the banks are selling their assets. The workers have not been paid for 10 months. And so while spending more and borrowing more, the traditional sources of income for this country have been destroyed. Aside from that, I worked very hard to bring on two new oil wells to increase our revenue and our volumes of oil and gas. The advantage is if we get more gas, it helps us to bring the cost of electricity down because we don't need to use heavy fuel oil to fire our thermal plants. We use gas. Right now, we have a shortfall of about 25% gas, and so we have to fill it with crude oil. And you know what happens when the prices of crude oil go up, and our electric tariffs also go up. This government, since they came for eight years, have wasted everybody's time. There's been no major development in the oil and gas sector. Indeed, those who were, who were even producing oil and gas, they've hounded some of them out. ENI had to uh, evacuate all their expatriate staff to Cote d'Ivoire because of some litigation that was going on, which the president should have stepped in and resolved. He never did that. He went all the way to the International Court of Arbitration before a decision was taken. Now they are calling ENI to the table, calling the other uh, 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 partner to the table to discuss an issue that they should have done three years ago. And so there's been no addition in terms of oil and gas. We should have been getting more revenue from there. That one too is down. And so you have a situation like this when the government is overspending, overborrowing, and at the same time making less money, I mean, taking the wrongest decisions in the sectors that should be bringing in additional money. These are some of the issues that um, have happened. So I've signaled that we're going to declare an emergency in the cocoa sector to boost up.
production as soon as uh, possible. We should be able to do that in one season or two seasons. We should be able to bring uh, cocoa back by giving the farmers an attractive price, providing them with the inputs so that they can increase their production, so that we can export more cocoa, bringing new technology, grafting, um, small-scale irrigation schemes, so that when the weather is very dry, the farmers can use boreholes to water the cocoa to reduce the stress on the trees. These are all things that we'll do. We must get more from our extractive industry. So we're going to look at the whole mining sector and see how we can um, 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 get more in terms of Ghanaian's participation in gold mining, in all the mining uh, industry, in terms of um, getting more uh, revenue from mining, that's an area we'll look at so that we can bring in additional money. We're going to get the oil and gas people to pump like, like crazy because oil is in transition. If you don't pump all your assets now, electric cars are coming, the world is changing, there's going to be a reduction in reliance on uh, crude oil. And so if you have those assets, you must be pumping and selling as fast as you can, you know, so that you don't have what they call stranded assets. Because if the world moves on and you have oil in the ground, nobody needs it, and so it will be stranded. So it's called stranded assets. And so you must do that too, so that you're able to invest that money in things that would earn dividends uh, for your country. But indeed, in addition to all this, we must cut waste because we're going to the IMF for $3 billion. And yes, every year, if you look at what we lose in terms of waste, in terms of inefficiency, we probably would not have needed to go to the IMF if we were able to plug these loopholes. Every year we talk about it, but nothing substantial is done. We're going to look at that in a more dramatic manner. But above all, what we are going through, the adversity we are going through, must teach us to depend on ourselves more. We must cut down our import bill. I mean, we are producing a lot of rice here in Fumbisi, and the farmers were complaining to me that they have stocks from last year that they have not been able to sell. How can we be importing this large amount of rice, and yet we have local rice that we have produced, and the farmers cannot sell it? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And so government must give the farmers a minimum guaranteed price. And government must put its money where its mouth is. We must provide the money to buy the rice off the farmers. We must process that rice and use it to feed our school children, use it to feed our hospitals, stop our schools and hospitals and other government institutions from buying imported rice. They must eat the local rice. And so that will give a market for the farmers to be able to continue to invest in their farms, we must provide them with processing facilities. The whole Fumbisi, there's a small rice mill somebody has set up. Government said they were setting up a rice mill. It is not functional yet. Whatever it is, I don't know. If we come, we'll look at it. But I think that there's the need for a bigger capacity. There's a big rice mill in, um, in Nyangpala, Avnash. And I don't know why there's not a connection with buying the paddy from here and uh, re re um, processing it there. But these are all bottlenecks that the Ministry of Agriculture must look at and resolve. We need to add value for the farmers. And so if there's a processing plant here where they take their rice and the rice is processed and back packaged nicely, it adds value. The farmer will get more than just selling the paddy. The paddy, the market women and middlemen come and buy it for cheap. They take it to Accra, they process it and put it on the market and they make the bigger margin than the farmer makes. But if we have a processing plant here that processes the rice for a fee for the farmer and adds value to his rice, then he can sell the rice at a higher value than he's doing currently. The 24 um, hour economy is achievable and it's not a new thing. I didn't conceptualize it. It was in our 40 year development plan in 2016 that I launched and many countries are implementing it. If we continue to work eight hours a day, it will take us 30 years to come out of this financial crisis. We need to speed up. And that's why I give the example of the pharmaceutical sector, and that's just one sector. If we increase demand for our own health products, we should be able to double the workforce and increase the number of hours that the pharmaceutical sector works. And so for analgesics, that is painkillers, 
for antibiotics, for cough syrups, for um, uh, uh, ARVs and, and, and drugs like that. If we say we're going to buy our own local production first before we look at imported uh, 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 drugs, it will give our pharmaceutical companies more money. It will make them able to add on production lines. And then they will not need to work from 8 to 5. They will need to work from 8 to 12 or 8 to the following morning. And that will enable them to take on more um, uh, people. And so if we increase the working hours, you cannot use the same uh, uh, number of employees to work those longer hours. You need to take on additional employees. And that means that more young people will get jobs. In one breath, they say, oh, but companies are doing it already. Then in another breath, oh, we don't die a 24-hour economy. We don't understand it. How did you know companies are doing it already? You understand that companies are doing it already. But in the same breath, the same person will say, ah, but we don't even understand it. You know, and there are some people who have made their minds that they don't want to understand it. And they say if a person is not asleep, you can't wake him up because he's not asleep. He's awake already. So how can you wake up a person who is already awake? So um, it's something we'll implement. The new projects that we'll bring in, if we have uh, new rice processing plants that are processing the rice of the farmers, we'll let it, them work 24 hours a day so that they can employ more young people. My father had a rice processing plant. My father was a farmer. I used to work there on vacations. I used to work the night shift. I remember there was a night shift we, we used to work in. You work uh, one week on day shift, and then the following week you go on night shift. And it, it used to happen like that. And so um, it's possible, and we would not there. Other it's possible. This is it's possible 24-hour economy. <laughs> um, the Bokunaba put a request for a new region. I didn't say, when you asked the question, you said, I said I'll create a new region. I didn't say I'll create a new region. He put a request for a new region. And I told him that the criteria for new regions is one, population size, two, land size, and three, economic viability. And I said that there's a process, a constitutional process for doing it. And so first, they'll have to petition for a new region. I know the uh, Member of Parliament for Boko Central has written to the Speaker, but that is not a petition. The petition must come from the uh, persons in the, including the Member of Parliament, the Chiefs and all that, to the President. And then the President has to set up a commission of inquiry. And the commission of inquiry will evaluate whether the area qualifies for a new region based on what I said, population size, on uh, land size, and economic viability. And when it has done that, the Commission of Inquiry would either say yes, it is possible to create a new region, or it will say no. And so it does not lie in my power to create a new region, and I never said I was going to create a new region. I was just showing the processes by which new regions are created. But what I said was, that area is comparable to some other areas. I mean, for instance, if you take the um, um, Savannah region or the Northeast or the Western North, their population might be almost equivalent to that. If you take economic viability, they are a commercial center because Boko is a trading uh, area and all that. Uh, if you take land size, I don't know, I've never measured the land size of that area. But if you take the constituencies that there are six, uh, the districts are six, and uh, maybe in other places they have the same number of districts. This was just uh, something that I was saying comparatively. But all in all, it depends on the constitutional processes. After the Commission of Inquiry has recommended even yes, it must be subjected to a referendum in which not less than 40% of the people must vote and 75% of them must say yes. So it's a complicated process. And so let's um, 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 correct the misconception. I didn't say when I became president I'm creating a new region. I'm saying that the Bokunaba requested a new region and I was explaining the processes that has to be gone through. My information is that the vice president went there and he said the same thing to him. And the vice president said the same thing about uh, the constitutional processes for creating a new uh, region. Um, the Boga Boku Pomakom Road, <coughs> I cut the sword for it, and we started work on it. This government has continued the work, but the work has not been completed, uh, mo mainly because of the debt restructuring. 
um, the financing that was being used for it has been affected by the debt restructuring. So currently the contractor has demobilized and so some of the bridges are left undone and there are many stretches of it that have also not been done. So we need to find new funding to be able to complete it. It's a very important road and um, it carries a lot of traffic and so it's a commitment that I made that when we come we'll do everything in our power to continue and complete it. With regards to the quality it is a double surface dressing road and so it's bituminous and so it's not the same as the Kasua. Kasua is an asphaltic concrete road. This is a double surface bituminous road but it is always a first step to do a double surface between us road and then later you can come and put an asphaltic concrete overlay on it because you'd have done the sub base of the road already and so at least we have a first step let's complete the road so that we can have traffic going to and fro and when we have the financial wherewithal we can come and put an asphaltic uh, concrete layer over it so that it can last longer than um, it, it currently can um, it's something we'll prioritize, and um, I think that's the third question. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, sir. And I recall that when you discussed the matter to do with the new region, you actually used the word consider. I recall that vividly. So, yes, I think that he's giving you ample clarification. So, can we have the next set of questions, please? Good morning. My name is Atungo Idrisu Kasim. I work with Wimpan Radio and a reporter to TVXYZ in the region. My question is, Your Excellency, um, we can uh, see that uh, corruption has taken over the whole nation. If you are giving, if the group of Ghana gives you the opportunity to re- um, come back to power as a president of this nation how are you going to fight this corruption in the country thank you <laughs> good morning and morning. my name is Emmanuel Koluk of Word FM and uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, His Excellency uh, during your visit to the Talisi district uh, the Parliamentary candidate Daniel Doon Mahama did mention that the Frafra speaking community have no training college. And for that matter, the next NDC government will establish a training college in Talisi, which will be called the Bonaboto Training College. I want to find out from you if backroom conversation has gone on for this particular training college and what will be the purpose of the training college and also I want to make an appeal I want to make an appeal and it has to do with farming uh, if you look take the, a look at the Upper East region uh, most of us we are farmers and bringing uh, like your service uh, farmer service center that you spoke about uh, for me I would like you to add solar mechanized boreholes to it which will be more closer to the farmers than uh, the dams that we are, we, are, we are digging everywhere because this will improve the farmer to be able to have at least his own farm within his own backyard whereby he will not need to travel to other places to farm and besides some of this some of our farmers during the dry season farming especially the dams side some of them have to pay money to the landowners to be able to access the land to do the irrigation farming. But once they have a solar mechanized borehole which is closer to them, at least they can be able to uh, do their farming in their own backyard. We all also know that if you take a look at the Upper East region, still on the farming issue, the government has introduced uh, one village, one dump. I think it's helping. But to improve on it, we should have one village, ten boreholes, mechanized boreholes with huge poly tanks, which can help the uh, farmers. And in that case, the agri-extension officers can take in charge of that, and they can also contribute 
every monthly they pay a quota so that our judicial assemblies can also get something to be able to maintain the project. So I think this is what I want to add uh, to it. If only Ghanaians give you the uh, power, the nod to lead the country once again. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you very much. My name is Vaida Akurubiri. Radio Grune is a community radio station in Bulgaria. My question is, the young and the old are crying for hardship in the country. Do you think when you become the president of the Republic of Ghana, you'll be able to change the hardship? Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. President, can we please have you? She said the third one is about hardship, please. Can you do something about the hardship? Yes, there's a lot of hardship. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just take this very quickly. Um, hardship. Hardship is the result of the economic crisis we're going through. Um, we've seen the prices of goods and services increase astronomically. Normally, when you have an inflationary spiral, its net effect and its impact on the people is hardship. And so, as quickly as possible, we must bring inflation down because inflation uh, reflects in the rates of increase of prices of products. So, for instance, you find that today cement is 140 cities. How much is it in Bulgaria? A bag of cement? 110. 110. And um, in 2017, that same cement would have sold in Bulgaria at about 30 cities. And so you're paying how many times more for a bag of cement than you used to pay some years back. And that reflects in terms of, it's, it's a, fall, a fallout of the economic crisis that we're in. So as quickly as possible, bringing inflation down to reduce the rate of growth of um, uh, prices of goods and services must be a priority in order to bring, bring down hardship. The other is to increase the incomes of the people so that they are making more money and they are able to look after themselves. And like I said, this is an agricultural area, so interventions that allow the farmers and people engaged in agriculture to be able to increase their incomes is something that we must uh, look at. And that's why we're talking about, uh, it leads to the next question, farmer service centers, support for farmers, minimum guaranteed prices, helping them to market their products, and so on and so forth. Those are all issues that we can do. There's also the issue of the Women's Government Bank. Because women, if you empower women, it affects the whole society. The women reinvest their incomes in the family, in their children, and all that. And so if we give women small credit, to be able to invest in their small and medium enterprises, be able to do their trading, sell their food and so on and so forth, uh, take care of their small uh, agricultural backyard gardens and all that. It will increase the family incomes and that would help to alleviate some of the hardship. And so those interventions are necessary and those are the kinds of interventions that we intend to concentrate on when we, we come. With regards to solar mechanized boreholes, yes, um, it's possible. Um, it's just a matter of um, looking at the comparative advantage in terms of cost. Um, you cannot drill a solar borehole on every small holder's farm. That's the problem. Because the cost of doing a one mechanized borehole will probably be far more than the, uh, um, the uh, output of, of the farm. So you need to get a bit of scale to be able to use that. I have a farm, I have drilled five boreholes and I use the boreholes for irrigation. I have an onion uh, farm, I do uh, soya bean, I do uh, maize and um, I have drilled at least five boreholes but I'm talking about 300 acres and the boreholes are yielding quite well. Uh, one of them is an aquifer so I've not put a pump in the borehole but the water just keeps coming by itself. And it's not everywhere you get a good yielding borehole. So you might drill somewhere and get nothing. You might drill somewhere and the quality of the water is not good enough. And so it's not like a final solution uh, for agriculture. And that's why we try to put in irrigation dams. 
this government did not understand the concept of dry season gardening and irrigation dams. It's not a small dugout that they do that can sustain dry season gardening. You must look at the topography of the area, do the dam and make sure that the amount of irrigable land is enough to sustain dry season gardening. And that's why we started the Tamni Dam. Tamni Dam can irrigate about 3,000 acres. And so if every farmer has five acres and is growing uh, uh, onions and tomatoes and all that, it will reduce the amount of tomatoes and onions we have to import from Burkina Faso and Niger. We have the Via Dam. We got some money for it under GCAP. You know, this government did not apply it. Eventually, they went to Parliament and varied the use of the money and put it into planting for food and jobs. So the expansion that should have taken place in Via, so that you could allocate more land to the young people to farm, has not been done. We did the rehabilitation of Tono, but Tono is not being put to, to full use yet. If it's put to full use, it should be able to produce much more tomatoes and other products for the market. So we have the capacity to be able to uh, expand. For instance, Lambusé had a dam that broke. I recently, from my own resources, went and rehabilitated that dam for them. And it can irrigate about another uh, 600, 700 acres of land. And the young people in, um, in Lambusier can establish their farms and use the water for irrigation. The water is enough. Apart from that, they have started fishing and catching uh, a lot of catfish in there. So these are the little interventions that we can do that can improve our people's lives. Um, the lack of a tertiary educational institution um, in, in that area is not only talency. They're actually talking about the whole Bonaboto area. That includes Bongo, Nabdam, you know, uh, and, and includes Tongo. So that whole area has no tertiary institution. That's why I was saying there are some blind spots when it comes to tertiary education. And so the children have to leave their communities and travel far if they have to go to college of education or go to university or something like that. And so in future what we'll do is we'll map out those blind spots and then we, when we're establishing new colleges of education or institutions of higher learning, we will try to position them in those areas that do not yet have them. Instead of just adding more to where they already have an abundance of uh, uh, higher educational institutions. Um, corruption is probably the highest uh, in the Fourth Republic under this government. And I'm not saying it because I'm the opposition leader. Transparency International per Corruption Perception Index shows that it is the highest this government has done. The perception of corruption is the highest. But you can't measure real corruption. You measure the perception. And so if it says the perception uh, of corruption is highest, then it means that uh, corruption has gone higher. But even just anecdotally, you can tell that there's not the will to crack down on corruption because the president himself is the one who normally comes out first and shields people who are accused of, of corruption. And, and there are many cases where he's cleared them. And I was surprised. He said every single case of corruption in his government has been investigated and dealt with. <laughs> I'm not sure whether he lives in the same country with us or he comes from Jupiter to come and visit us, you know. But um, certainly we know better. We know that that's not true. To be able to deal with corruption, I think that we should take away political interference. We should leave the anti-corruption institutions to do their work. This government is fighting the OSP. Indeed, they've made attempts to, they hounded the first one so much, Martin Amidu, that he had to resign. And the second one, they set up the OSP office, but they are the ones fighting with the OSP and, you know, uh, trying to get him out. The OSP should be left to work, and I make that commitment when I come into office. The special prosecutor would have a free hand to uh, do any investigations he wants. And it's not going to be, what we do is, it's easy when you come into office to investigate your uh, predecessor government. They, they are your political opponents, so investigating them and prosecuting them, indeed you will enjoy doing it. But the real test of the fight against corruption is when it happens in your regime that you are able to investigate and deal with it. And the only way to do it is to allow the anti-corruption institutions to have their way. 
And so I have sounded a warning that all those who are lobbying and wanting to come and serve in my government, you do so at your own risk. If you go and do something that brings you into the radar of IOKO or the OSP, I'm not going to come and, and, and defend you. You have to go and defend yourself. And if you are found culpable, um, it will be your, your business. And so I think that that's the way uh, to go. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the clarification. So we'll take the very next three sets. I can see Mr. Agbagba with his hand right up there. Yes, so if you can please join them. My name is Kwame Asante. I work with Tunia TV, Tunia FM. Your Excellency, please, I would like you to answer my question in chief for me. One, you mentioned of cooperative mining. No. Okay. <laughs> Ose Oba Obe introduce cooperative mining. Me per se ye who the cooperative mining no omobe ya ebe bo yen sa se ye kwa ye any yens you no baya and concourse tit you any etifi epu ye mente muha ye yen shede ni miabi bri ni a de ewahano dear mining on be ya na and say ye environment no and two se o hwe ahoke ka e mabuna ewo mantamimu edishia wo ewo enafua enan a wo de kwa probonu mu a ahoke ka wo miye pa me pese mi hu eni daso ben ena wo ho e de masa e mabunu ya o modi ahoke ken e bi shia we me da se thank you my name is mark a1 radio boga your excellency very recently the ghana statistical service conducted the multi-dimensional poverty index now if you look at that index 43 percent of the people in the upper east region are multi-dimensionally poor again the level of intensity is 47.5 percent uh, this measures poverty across four dimensions and 13 indicators your excellency uh, you were in NABDAM recently. That same report tells us that six out of ten people in NABDAM are poor. Again, if you look at the national picture, about seven districts out of the 15 in the Upper East region uh, are last bottom 15 of that uh, MPI across the country. I'm just curious if you have a specific plan for the Upper East region beyond the national policies that you hope to implement. And just very quickly, Your Excellency, I'm just curious whether you are going to cancel again the teacher nursing training allowances or you are going to let it remain as is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Sadat Dabo. I work with GBC. Uh, Your Excellency, my question is, Galamsi is a major problem in Ghana. And for that matter, Upper East Region and the Talented Districts is becoming the mining hub of the nation. What is your vision for the mining sector in the country and Upper East Region? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, sir. So we can have uh, Thank you very much. Nedika, um, the question now occurs to me in Katrina. May I know Asana? Um, my friend Niaka. Um, cooperative mining, a uh, yeah, concept, I uh, had yeah, I just say, a she share for fro, I ya pessy at the bar. I just say, so what share be be a year mining now? Yanka say, Upper East Region, ha. Ya wo mining operations, me no, ah, back home, a war, a year, Shanzi mining, a year, China for being a young mining or home. And a four for being so about I a friend of cardinal mining. Now, baby, I'm a coyer. No, a mabunu be bray any ye gana for a chess or more honor. Almost so on person we are mining a cacra, no mutimina be be a timidation or more. Now, at San say big mining companies now for concessions me no no. Nyaya can say baby so on why. At that why your name is a gold or home. And you see a bar, you have geological survey, I yet a whole exploration near Mappe Hall out. Now a Mabunone and Crofon Pesce or Moya Sam Mine and no. You become more boom in cooperatives. And you on the register as a cooperative. Now you the a Mabununa or Moya University of Mining and Technology, a war Takwa Umats. Our moon war a moon name day. 
ya de omo be ba be ka cooperative for no ho no ma kire omo sane ye omo be ye man ne no abra obi en pra abia obi en hre ne kwa omo ye man ne no su ya omo be kire omo sane na omo be kata ya friend land reclamation omo be kata asase no omo be san pia pia akata kata amra no no ma san dua dua en dua a e won ho faso nti san yo mani na ya dia ye betimi aye and no, ena a year the concept of cooperative mining. Na enye apa East region hankwa be bia ye mining bia ye the sa concept no be ma. Se ne be ya ye mabunu no so ebeti me enye ejuma ye. Big mining companies ne say omuti mi je wo ko be bia ye ko ye ya. Company in Bakun was 60 kilometer square. Ai che se enye 60 kilometer square ni nyina ena obe mining. Be bi wo ho a o hwa gold no and also do do and ti e honya dia e che se e ya dia and then ya chine ya obekwa ko ya mining wo ho and ti nye ka ne se ya hwe asase a big mining companies na je be bia e che se gold no en shedan do so a omoni en na so se obekwa ko ya bibi wo ho ye ti mi ntwa ho kakra na ya mabunu no ya de omo ya cooperative a ni etwa ama omo eh how many acres how many acres no omo so omo akotutu kakra ni ombe nya no na omo de ahwe omo ho omo wie nso a na omo a ya de omo aka omo ho a omo wo mine ho nim de omo kire omo se ne ya de bulldozer no be pian pian akata kata amra no na omo nya forestry for no ma ma omo nua no mo dua dua egu so na eche se asan abe ye ye biu nti ano e ya de a e wo se ehwe uh, Ose Senya uh, Emamnu Ebo Jeme So Abra Meba Upper East Region No um, um, e Yadia Menije Ye Na Minim Se Ejna Se Omabamu Ebu Because Omo Sha And Sema Abanwe E Kachira Omo Nana Kufado Ene Ninya Baumia And Sema Omo Kaye Bosha Omo Sha Omo Ni Ade Ade Ni Ina Omo Inti Mie Ndiso Inti Ama Eba Bunu No Aba Mwe Omo Uhu Omo Da Chin Ye Inti Omo Pense Se Emo Omo Pense Omo Se San Inti Bebi Ame Kobia Omo Bodje Me So Na E Ade A Na Me Ni So Ye E Non So E Se Min Kran Se Me Ba E O Se Mi Ye Juma Deng na mitimi e ye adia ebe biye kwa ya ma omu ma omu so omu etimi anye juma ye no omu etimi ashe omu hon enti eno ena e si ye question e disu that one was in english multi-dimensional poverty multi-dimensional poverty has increased you know from the time of the beginning of the millennium that is from uh, President Rawlings into 2000 and then when President Kufour came uh, we came up with what we call the Millennium Development Goals and the target was to reduce poverty and Ghana was one of the best performance in terms of poverty reduction unfortunately over the last eight years we've seen an escalation the World Bank has said that 800,000 people in the last two years or so have fallen below the poverty line and people continue to become poorer also exacerbated by the economic crisis the capital of a lot of small and medium Ghanaian enterprises has been wiped out by the debt restructuring people have lost money in the bonds people's little savings that they put in provident funds in other funds you know have been wiped out indeed the savings of the Ghanaian middle class has been completely wiped out and so it means that our indigenous capital has gone down and this is the capital that is invested that creates jobs that uh, creates incomes for Ghanaian families and that is why we are seeing an expansion in poverty so as quickly as possible we need to rebuild indigenous capital we need to give Ghanaians opportunities to be able to recoup their savings in places where we think we can do restitution uh, uh, which I mean the president I hear gave um, the, uh, instruction that 50,000 bailouts should be paid some of these um, provident funds run into millions and so you give them a first 50,000 bailout another 50,000 that's 100,000 you owe them say 10 million or 11 million what is 100,000 
to a group like that you know and so we must take it more seriously if government made a mistake and has to recompense these people we must find the money to do so so that they're able to get their capital back and be able to invest it and that is the only way we can uh, uh, get our people out of poverty you see we must have specific programs for the poorest parts of this country the problem with this government is they treat everybody the same and so when they came coastal development authority middle bed development authority northern development belt authority it's like and you give money to all these authorities and so you're not targeting where the pockets of poverty are I think that in going forward we must look at where the poorest parts of this country are and target our poverty alleviation measures to, to suit that. But even now it's getting worse because there's been a marked increase in multidimensionally poor people in Ashanti region and you'd have thought that you know that would be a more economically buoyant thing. So it shows that the spread of poverty over the last eight years is affecting even some of the regions that you know we would have thought should be you know more economically advanced and so we need one to stabilize the economy stabilize the currency bring inflation under control governments must cut expenditure cut its quote according to its cloth you know not overspend you know more than it can create more uh, space for the private sector to be able to get credit to invest you know bring interest rates down those are the things that we must do immediately otherwise if this crisis continues more people will continue to sink below the poverty line and um, teachers allowances what's the use of re um, um, the reintroduction of teachers allowances when you can pay them nurses allowances government owes in some cases 30 months some people have gone into school from first year to third year completed and never got an allowance government is pretending to pay the allowances for political expediency and well we were substituting it with a student loan um, the students were not happy and um, indeed let me even explain how we did it we didn't cancel it at once we said those who are enjoying the allowances will enjoy it till they complete so the new ones who came had never had the allowance we said we'll start you with the student's loan so it's not like you had the allowance and we took it away you had never ever been part of the allowance and so we're facing out those who were on the allowance and replacing them with those who were going to go on the student's loan um jack toronto and his younger brother said they can pay <laughs> and they will pay and that I'm a very wicked president to take, you know, the uh, allowance away. But that is it. They're, they are not paying. You know, they owe so many months of arrears. They can't pay NAPCO trainees. You know, they made a lot of noise with NAPCO. You owe them, the children, about 10 months arrears you can't pay. And for the first time even, they can't pay national service allowances. National service allowances have never been in arrears because we don't pay them anything substantial it is just a stipend and so every government before this government never ever had national service allowances in arrears this is the first time this is happening you said you could pay teacher trainee allowances please i'm appealing on behalf of the trainees again teachers and nurses that you pay them uh, their allowances even with regards to the teacher training allowances what they've done is they've reduced the allowance and split it in half and giving the students 200 CDs I think and they're using 200 CDs for their feeding in our time we we're feeding them free of charge government was buying their feeding and then we're giving them the allowance so even though they've said they are retaining the allowance one the allowance doesn't come two when it comes it's reduced slashed by more than 50 percent and half of it is used to feed them and they're giving the remaining uh, uh, little but all those allowances are in arrears and i think that government should look at it we will keep the status quo as it is because for the nurses particularly under the student loan scheme they don't qualify and so we need to make some amendments before 
we can put them on student's loan. So we'll keep the status quo, like I said, until we're able to make the necessary amendments to transition everybody onto a student's loan. And we're calling it the enhanced student loan because we need to increase the amount so that it's meaningful for the um, student to be able to do something with it. And as soon as the student gets a job, we must have a mechanism to start deducting it so that we can use it to support uh, the next batch of students coming. Um, the last question was almost the same as the first one on Galam C, you know, and how we can um, um, deal with it. It's to make sure that we, um, um, the, uh, the agencies that are supposed to enforce, you know, are able to do their work. I had said before, when I was president, when I pulled out the uh, military, you know, that sending the military and chasing those boys is not going to solve it. We need a different innovative means of solving it. And so we have made our proposals in all the districts that there's mining, we're going to open offices of the Minerals Commission and the Environmental Protection Agency and all the agencies that deal with mining so that we bring them closer to where the mining is taking place. And we're going to hold them responsible for enforcement of the mining bylaws. We're going to attach students from UMAT to all the small scale mining companies so that they're able to supervise and show them what to do. They'll pay a little bond. And so as they mine, they'll be putting some money aside and that money will be given back to them when they have finished mining and they have, you know, repaired the area. If they haven't, then the money would be paid to uh, some other person or company that will go and do the reclamation. And so that is one of the things. And then also involving the chiefs in enforcement in terms of environmental protection. I think that the time has come for us to give the chiefs some authority in terms of helping with environmental protection, in terms of sanitation, in terms of uh, afforestation and things like that. We need to bring our chiefs in because they are the grassroots, they are with the people and um, they have a certain uh, influence. They are respected by their people and so I think that they have some moral persuasion that if we bring to bear on what government is doing, it will give us better results than currently we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So we have the last uh, three. We are actually running out of time for our next program. So if we can please be very quick. Thank you very much. Um, His Excellency, I want to let you know that um, the life of our elderly mothers in the north and specifically upper east region is in danger this is as a result of witchcraft accusations witchcraft accusations is becoming a trending norm as far as the upper east region and other parts of the country is concerned the bill that was passed by parliament has not actually received any accent by the president I would want to know, if given the opportunity, what would you do differently? Mr. President, development is something that is very dear in some of us, our hearts, as far as Upper East Region is concerned. Mostly we hear from your appoint appointees, especially the 14 MPs representing NDC in this particular region, that their mother is not in the kitchen. Mr. President, we want to know what you would do differently if given the norm when it comes to uh, power as far as development of Upper East is concerned. Let me have it here, sir. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Gilbert Mawili Agbe, Upper East correspondent for Daily Graphic. Mr. Former President, I'm sure it has, it has been brought to your attention the issue of skyrocketing poultry imports, particularly frozen chicken, which also poses health concerns for consumers. In the Upper East region, specifically in the Zebila area, there is an abundance of guinea fowl. The local community has repeatedly called for a processing factory to convert these birds into frozen food products. My question is, 
what viability do you see in creating a sustainable poultry industry around Guinea fowls to reduce our reliance on imports? While I'm aware of past political initiatives related to this, I would like to know your stance on the potential for, in the, for this industry to thrive. Thank you very much. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity. I'm Nicholas Azebire, Dreams FM. Your Excellency, you were right when you said uh, going around the issues are largely the same. In the Upper East region, they have remained unchanged. This is your stronghold. The Upper East Regional Hospital has been one issue. Uh, we have the CK Tedam, that is a medical school. We do not have a tertiary facility, at, I mean a teaching hospital. What will you do? And also the airport issue. And what will you do with the NDA? Thank you. For the opportunity. My name is Javis Avoka. I work with uh, ZFM in Zebila. Your Excellency, um, I was happy you touched on the Borga Boku Road. However, another important road, uh, as far as this region is concerned, is the completion of the Eastern Corridor Road. I think that uh, it passes through Nakwanduri in the northeast, through Garu, uh, through Misiga, and then the to Kolugungu. Uh, all the literature I've read on that route, there's nothing that talks about this particular stretch I've just mentioned. I don't know, um, is it still in your plan that when you come to power in January, you focus on that particular route and will this stretch be given attention? And then finally, Upper East, we know this is a, a region with close proximity to Burkina Faso and other neighboring countries. The troubles in those countries also affect us. We have had refugees running to Ghana. I don't know if your team is, is aware of the security challenges that this region is faced with due to the happiness in other countries. And what are your plans for, or uh, your plans for dealing with this? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Can we have you take these ones very quickly so we can wrap up? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, whenever there's poverty and crisis, there's an increase in witchcraft. <laughs> because people don't tend to take responsibility for themselves. They must find somebody to blame for adversity. And so if they are not able to find opportunity, they are not able to uh, satisfy their full potential, you know, there's crisis, there's hunger and all that. They must find somebody to blame. And normally they will look for the most vulnerable person in their society, and these are the poor old women, and accuse them of witchcraft. And so it's a direct correlation to the increase in poverty, the increase in accusations of witchcraft. But look, let me tell you, there is no witchcraft. No, your, no, none of your mothers is responsible for your poverty. The, the old woman is looking after herself. She's also struggling like you. And then you come and say she is responsible for your, your uh, poverty. No old lady is responsible for tying your womb and you can't have a child. You know, it is biological, it is medical, you know, you might have a restricted fallopian tube, you might have some internal condition that is preventing you from giving birth. Your mother didn't fly in the night and come into your stomach and tie your womb, or she didn't go and take it to a witch's conference and they cooked it and ate it. I mean, these are superstitions that we must kill. These are cultures that we must kill and kill completely. I've not looked at the anti-witchcraft bill yet, but anything that will protect these old men and women uh, from being accused of being wizards and witchcraft, I think that is something that we must look at. The president has not assented to it. I don't know for what reason, but I'll find out. But, I mean, I have been drawn to the issue of uh, witchcraft because of my wife. Uh, my wife's foundation, Lodina Foundation, um, is the one that has worked closely with the Gambaga Witches Camp and she's done a lot of programs for them. She provides them with food, she provides them with cloth, you know, to sew uh, clothes for themselves and all that. So through her work I've become familiar uh, with it. And one of the things they try to do with the Ministry of Gender 
and children and social protection was to try and reintegrate these women back into their societies and so they go and talk to the chief they perform some rituals they pacify the family and then they're able to move the women uh, back i think that is something that we can continue i know when we're in government they closed one of the witches camps because they were able to move the women and reintegrate them in their uh, society so i think that that's something we should do but i'll look at this anti witchcraft bill and see what the issues are for which the president you know has refused to give his accent um you see the point is members of parliament are advocates for development and so i think what they're trying to refer to is that they have more access to the corridors of power when their government is in place than when a different government is in place that's all that they're trying to say it's like if my government is in place and and i'm, I'm an mp from that particular party i have more access to the ministers and especially where the constitution says the majority of ministers should come from parliament then it means that those ministers are their colleagues in parliament anyway so they can make an appointment and go and see the minister and advocate for something for their constituency so when they say their government is in opposition all they're trying to say is that um, they don't have as much access as they should but let me explain to you the Members of Parliament are not the prime movers of development in the constituencies and the districts. It is rather the district chief executives. And development is not moving because this government has reduced the district assembly's common fund from 7.5% of total revenue that we were paying to 5%. And so it means that the districts are receiving less funds for their own development. And so if you ask the district as, uh, uh, chief executives in this government, they are, they are really suffering. I, I really pity them. They are the most long-suffering district chief executives in the history of the Fourth Republic. Because everybody is blaming them for not drilling a borehole here, for not building a school there. But they don't have the funds because their government is not giving them the funds. They've reduced the funds. And apart from that, they are not releasing the district assembly's common fund. Even the share of the MPs, which is a small percentage of it, is only when the MPs put pressure on, in Parliament and tell the Finance Minister they won't approve something for him, then they'll release the share of the MPs. Meanwhile, the one that goes to the uh, district itself is in arrears for so many quarters. And so you can't blame the uh, district chief executives. They just don't have the funds to be able to do it. So I said, when we come, we're going to work to increase the share of the districts back to 7.5 percent because the constitution says between 5 and 8 percent it should be between 5 and 8 percent we went as high as 7.5 percent this government has come down to 5 percent and apart from that they siphon off some of the money to the development associations and so it doesn't impact the district because the development associations uh, I said development as authorities, development authorities. They sit somewhere in their office, then they say, go and build a school in Zebila. Instead of, if it was in the district, the district chief executive will identify a local contractor in Zebila to do it. And so the money stays in Zebila. But the development authorities will take a contractor from, say, Bolga or from Tamale and award him the contract to go and do in Zebila. And so when he goes and does it, the profit does not stay in Zebila, the profit goes elsewhere. And that is the effect the development authorities are having. So I'm saying that if you have money for the development authorities, give it to the districts, share it to the district and incre increase their, the, the share of revenue they have so that they can uh, invest in their own districts and be able to multiply um, the, the revenue in the district. I've been an MP before, and I remember when I was an MP, any time the District Assembly's Common Fund is released, uh, Bole Bambo is, is, is buoyant. The slaughterhouse, they kill a cow, people are buying meat, because they pay the contractors, the local contractors, and the local contractors to, you know, uh, uh, put money into the system. He, the hairdressers, the local contractor's wife will go and do her hair, the hairdresser to get some money. He goes and pays the filling station for the fuel he credited, 
the filling station attendant to get some money. He goes to the uh, beer bar with his friends, the beer bar person to get money. He goes and pays the cement that he borrowed for the contract, cement person to get money. So it has a multiplier effect in the uh, economy of the district. Unfortunately, that has dried up because the, assembly, the uh, district assembly's common fund is not coming and it is less than it used to be. And so these are the issues that we need to look at. Poultry imports. Poultry imports have increased. We're spending more on frozen chicken from outside. And that is because their own people are involved in importing the poultry. Uh, recently, one of their biggest financiers passed away. She's the biggest importer of poultry in Ghana, member of Council of State. And so you can be sure that this government is not interested in uh, uh, restricting uh, poultry imports. Um, also, because of the financial crisis, the cost of inputs in Ghana has gone up. So the cost of feed is high. The cost of all the things that they use to grow the poultry is up. And so our farmers are struggling, and it makes it easier to bring this uh, frozen poultry in. And most of the time, the tariffs are high, but they are able to escape the, the duties. So they are able to bring the uh, uh, poultry in at lower than our own poultry producers can produce. So most of the major poultry farms are shutting down. Akati Farms is, was one of the biggest poultry farms. The last time I heard they are struggling. I mean, I, I don't know if they shut down, but they're almost shutting down. We need to reverse that situation. We need to reverse that situation. And so we already have had an engagement with the Poultry Farmers Association. We know what the issues are. And when we come, we'll do everything to try and support them. This was one of the uh, SADA projects. And it was supposed to create an incubator for guinea fowls. And so the incubation uh, 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 plant was built. The incubators were put there. And they were going to incubate the eggs and raise day-old guinea fowl chicks. Distribution to households, 100 chicks, and you will be giving the poultry uh, house and shown how to uh, raise the guinea fowls. And then there was supposed to be a processing plant so that the guinea fowls will be bought off the households and processed and they will be putting, they will put them in uh, frozen trucks to send them down to the south to market. Unfortunately, the project ran into issues. The media criticized it, and they came and said the guinea fowls had flown to Burkina Faso. No guinea fowls flew to Burkina Faso. Guinea fowls are not migratory birds. And the project was not for you to come and see thousands of guinea fowls in one place. It was supposed to incubate the eggs and give the uh, guinea fowl uh, um, day old chicks to the farmers. And so somebody came and asked, he says he asked the, uh, the watchman, where are the guinea fowls? And then the watchman said, oh, they, uh, they go Burkina Faso, they go come the rainy season, they go come back. <laughs> and then it became, it took a life of its own, the media went and published it. And up to now there are people who believe that there were some guinea fowls that flew to Burkina Faso, you know. So that project died. But I think it's a project we can look at again. because. People find guinea fowl meat more healthy, and if you go to the south, they have roasted guinea fowl that people are consuming, and um, I do think that if we're able to increase guinea fowl production, it would help the incomes of a lot of uh, families. When we drive along the Zebula Road, you see vehicles parked, and the guinea fowl is, uh, you know, uh, grilled, and they buy it and chop it up and um, it makes a healthy meal and so it's something that we are prepared to look at. The Upper East Regional uh, Hospital, um, it's not been completed. We did phase one, I finished phase one and then we got the funding for phase two. It continued under this government, part of phase two. The phase two is not completed but the phase three is in danger because it was supposed to be uh, a, a facility from Saudi Arabia, the Saudi fund. And um, since the debt restructuring, one is not sure whether the funding will continue or not. So we need to come and take a look and see how we can um, uh, work to finish it. If we finish it, I think that it can be used temporarily for the students 
uh, who are doing medical training and Tamale is not far if they need some additional practicals they can move them to Tamale and bring them back until eventually we get a proper teaching hospital uh, here in, uh, in, in, the, in the Upper East. It happened with UDS when the Tamale uh, Regional Hospital was not yet a teaching hospital. The students used to be sent to Kumase for some of the practicals and brought back to Tamale until uh, the Tamale Teaching Hospital was upgraded, um, Tamale Regional Hospital was upgraded into a teaching hospital and then now UDS does their uh, practicals in the Tamale Teaching Hospital. So first let's finish the Regional Hospital and then they can do some of the practicals there but the rest they can go to Tamale and then eventually when we upgrade uh, uh, Boga Hospital into a teaching hospital then the training can continue. Um, we are going to look at all the development authorities again. I don't think that they've achieved the reason for which they were the Coastal Development Authority, Middle Belt and all that. We're going to look at it again and like I said, rather than just do blanket development authorities, we must do better targeting of the areas of poverty. What that structure will be, I don't know yet, but it's something that I think we should look at. Eastern Corridor, we're dedicated to finish it, finishing it. It was the concept of Professor John Ivan Sata Mills. Because of the food production in the Northeastern Corridor, he thought that if we did the Eastern Corridor Road, it will help to evacuate a lot of the agricultural products faster to the south. And that should reduce the price because then the transporters would reduce the fares for which they are uh, transporting. We've done segments of it. Um, I did the segment from uh, Gushegu to Otidamanko. That one is done. It's in good uh, condition. Uh, actually, we got to a, a point, this government continued with it because we had funding from Bra Brazil for it. The missing link is from Gushegu, Nakpanduri through Misiga Garu to Kulungungu and um, that is a priority we should be able to do it and if we do it it will, um, it will help to open up the Eastern Corridor. There are some portions like um, from Nkwanta, no from Damanko to Nkwanta and then we did the stretch from Nkwanta to Dodipepesu and then there's a stretch from Jasikain to Hohoi. Part of it has been done by Rolida, but there's a missing link just before you get to Hohoi. We need to do that. Then after you leave Hohoi, Have, all the way through Peki, there's another missing link there. And so we need to finish that to open up that uh, corridor. So it's a priority. But I also talked about the Northern Ring. And that is, we should be able to leave Bolga and go to Tumu and to Wa. That is a missing link. That road is not complete. And then from Wa, you go from Wa to Sola. The Wa Sola road is um, bitumen, but it's not been maintained, so it's in a poor state. And so we need to do that. Then you can go from Sola to Damango. That is part of the Sola Fufuso road. That was done. It's fairly good. Damango to uh, Fufuso Junction is good. Then Fufuso Junction back to Tamale. You turn left. It's good, perfect road. Then from Tamale to Yendi, this government has rehabilitated the Tamale Yendi road, so that's good. Then you can turn left again to Gushagu, which is part of the northern part of the eastern corridor, that is good. Then after Gushagu, the road is not good. You can pass through there to Kulungungu, turn left and come to Boko, and from Boko come back to Bolga. You should be able to do that round in 24 hours. And so that is going to be something that we look at because it will open up the north and improve transport, you know, in the northern sector. A uh, final question on terrorism. They say when your neighbor's beard is on fire, you fetch water and put it by your beard because uh, it can spread to your own beard. And so we know what is happening in Burkina Faso. Indeed, we should be working closer with our comrades in Burkina Faso. Unfortunately, this government has created some tension between us and Burkina Faso because our president went and opened his mouth too wide. You saw the video. He went and was doing concern about your neighbor. We all are here. We are suffering. You, America called you small. And you are so excited. And then your neighbor, you are doing concern about him. 
you know and so it has created some diplomatic tension he went he went there went and apologized but still it's not the best so <laughs> When government changes, we have to go and uh, talk to our neighbors because we must work together. Indeed, the whole anti-terrorism strategy of this sub-region was done in Accra. It's called the Accra Initiative. And so we are the hosts of that initiative. So we must be reaching out to them and seeing how we can collaborate with them in order that we quench the fire in their houses. Because if there's fire in your neighbor's house, you don't help him to put it off. It will spread to your house. And so I think that we must improve our relationship with Burkina Faso. At the same time, we must also strengthen our you know, uh, surveillance and security so that in case it comes into our borders, we are able to deal with it. And that is also the reason why we must solve the Boko crisis as quickly as possible. Because just across the border is where this thing is happening. And terrorism feeds in through a weak link. And so where you have crisis, that is where it will come through. And that is the reason why the issues of Boko must be dealt with. And that probably could be one of the reasons that they are requesting a region because of security. It can give a better focus on the security of the area and all that. But those are some issues that can be dealt with, you know, at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, sir. Thank you for this very insightful uh, question and answer session. Like I always say, he's actually the very best communicator you can find. Anything Mr. Mahama explains, you understand even much better. May I please call on the regional president of the Ghana Journalist Association here in Bolgatanga to please give us a very short vote of thanks. But let me say thank you to our regional communications officer, Jonathan Abdullah, you've done a very, very good job, and we are very, very grateful to you. Thank you. Okay. Good morning to you, Your Excellency, and your team members. My name is William Jalula, the Upper East Regional Chairman of the Ghana Journalists Association. Uh, before I give vote of thanks, I just want to, um, Your Excellency, um, somewhere in 2011, when you were Vice President, the then Finance Minister, Dr. Dufo, announced in 2011 that, that um, there was going to be one million dollar media development fund. Fast forward, we really haven't seen much of it. And so I just want to bring to your attention, in case you, um, you come back into office as President, you may want to look at that. And then. Um, the Upper East Region, one village, one dam. I just want to find out if you get the opportunity to lead the country again, you will want to expand those dams to enhance dry season farming. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you so much for spending time with us this morning. Um, I've been monitoring your tour across the region and it has been very fruitful. Uh, my colleagues who have been on the field with you have also represented the media fraternity very well and I'm sure that your team would have given you feedback on our performance. We thank God also for Jenny Messis and how he has taken you and your team through and we can only wish you the very best as you move to other parts of the country. You indicated you'll be moving to the water region. We pray that the good Lord will take you there safely. So thank you very much for spending time with us this morning. We are grateful that you have been with us. Just also to invite you for our award ceremony. Uh, the regional branch of the GGA will have our awards on the 30th of uh, this month. Maybe you want to come back and join us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The victory As of Mr. Mahama will be taking leave of us. We are running late for the next program and we have to go all the way to the Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. You're very great. See you soon.